Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. We got Hudson County View live and uncut. I'm your host, the perfect blend of braids and broad and the antimeter that knows how to keep calm and carry on, John R. Heinis. And uh, we got another great show for you, in my opinion. We got a lot to talk about, so we're going to dive right in as usual. So, first of all, on our plate, we are going to talk about a explosive investigative report, another exclusive from Hudson County View. One of my colleagues, Corey McDonald, reporting on a Bayonne Council candidate that was convicted of having sex with a child while he was in the U.S. Army. So, obviously, that is something that is drawing a lot of attention right now. So, we are going to talk about that at length. Uh, other, another thing on the docket today is the Hoboken City Council unanimously voted to ban e-scooters on the waterfront and in public parks. Uh, that was after a very passionate public portion session last night where I was fortunate enough to attend. So obviously we're going to let you know the skinny on that as well. Another thing that we're going to talk about is a very interesting case out of Jersey City. This dates back to a June 4th, 2017 case where there was a uh, high-speed police pursuit on Tunnelly Avenue Avenue near Route 1 and 9 and that ended up in a, uh, a fiery crash and there ended up being an innocent man that was injured and uh, there's a whole lot more details that we'll get into in uh, just a few minutes here but the bottom line is four police officers from Jersey City have been forced to resign and they have plea made plea agreements on what charges they'll be facing so we'll talk a bit about that and of course uh, we don't want to forget about our guest we're going to be joined by Hoboken's fifth ward council candidate Phil Cohen so we'll have Phil right when we come back from this break so just hang with us for a second. It takes more than a state-of-the-art medical facility to make a great hospital. It takes a team of dedicated medical professionals. That's the Jersey City Medical Center, Hudson County's number one hospital. Medical teams consisting of New Jersey's top doctors, magnet award-winning nurses, and accomplished hospital associates, all committed to your good health. That's what you have at the Jersey City Medical Center. Make Hudson County's number one hospital your first choice. Visit us on the web at Barnabas Health. Org. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments, and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, Jersey City, Hudson County's only monument maker, serving all faiths and cemeteries. Design studio and launch inventory on site. Cemetery inscriptions and custom orders welcome. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments, and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, just south of Seacorkers Road. Craftsmanship that will last for all eternity. Burns Brothers, Jersey City, Albert H. Hopper, North Arlington. Visit us on the net. Hudson County View, live and uncut. I'm John Arhitis, and today, again, we're joined with Hoboken's Fifth Ward Council candidate, Phil Cohen. So, Phil, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thanks, John. So, Phil, uh, let me uh, start here. Obviously, we learned uh, on short notice, everyone at once said, anyway, learned on short notice, I really should say, that Peter Cunningham would be seeking re-election uh, about mid-July, and you'd already been uh, an announced candidate for about two months. So just tell us uh, on what you thought and your reaction at that time. Uh, I was surprised, John. Uh, I, Peter had been the councilman for 12 years. Uh, I had supported him in his campaigns, and I was expecting him to throw his hat in for another four. Uh, so I had been knocking on doors for a few months. We had our kickoff party that you, had, uh, you attended and reported on in May. And uh, it came out of the blue to me. So uh, rather than having an incumbent like all the other wards of Hoboken for a city council election, the fifth ward is the one ward where we now have an open seat. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the other two candidates, needless to tell you, is uh, Tim Crowell and Nicola Maganuka. So uh, it's a very uh, diverse field, I think it's safe to say. But why do you think you're the most qualified person for the job as, uh, as of now? Well, John, I've lived in Hoboken for 33 years. I moved to Hoboken in 1986. I am someone who loves the city. I've raised my two daughters here. They're 23 and 19, and I've been really active in the community. I've served eight years on the zoning board. I'm a member of the Citizens Advisory Board working on the Rebuild by Design, uh, the $230 million federal plan to protect us from flooding. And I've been engaged. I've been involved in the community, and you've reported on some of the work that I've done in the city. So I think people have gotten to know me and how I've been a real volunteer and engaged in the community. 
Uh, the other two candidates, frankly, John, I just met them a few weeks ago. Uh, I, I've been engaged and involved in the community for a long time. Uh, I welcome them to the race, and they seem like nice people. Uh, but the truth is, I really, I really don't know them. Uh, but as I said to Mark when he interviewed me at our kickoff event in May, I wasn't really running in a way that I was talking about Peter Cunningham so much as I was talking about myself and the ideas that I have and why I think I would be a good representative for my neighbors in the Fifth Ward. And I'm continuing to run that way. So yeah, let, let's jump off on that point. So particularly in the Fifth Ward, what do you think uh, would be some things that you would like to uh, have your hand out or put your name out, I should say, uh, in the event you are elected right off the bat? Well, John, as I mentioned, I've been on the zoning board for eight years in Hoboken, so I know a lot about development. I've seen the pressures of big development in Hoboken and all the money that can be made by developers in our city. And right now we have a unique time because the northwest of Hoboken is zoned industrial. It's a historic designation that goes back to Hoboken's old era uh, when it was an industrial city. Uh, now is the time for the, for the northwest of Hoboken to be zoned for what it is today, uh, for parks, for light businesses, for light residential, but not to be overwhelmed by huge development uh, where we already have bad traffic and congestion problems. How can we build the Fifth Ward new park in the Northwest and new living facilities in the Northwest in a way that works for our city? So that's something I'm really excited to be a part of. Also, I mentioned I'm on the Rebuild by Design Citizens Advisory Board. I lived through Hoboken through Hurricane Sandy in 2011. We saw the devastation, people without power for a week, our cities flooded, people displaced. We can't let that happen again. We, we're lucky. We won a $230 million federal grant. Uh, we can now spend that money. We have great plans in place. Ground breaking should start next year. And as a councilman, I'm going to be committed to seeing that project through to make sure that we're fully protected from the wrath of rising storms and climate change. So yeah, on Rebuild by Design, obviously that's a, a federal project in conjunction with the city. I believe there's three or four different uh, agencies on that, but could you just explain to us as a council representative, what, would the, what exactly would you be able to do to help facilitate this process? Well, I've been going to the meetings and I've noticed that there are certain council people who've been attending the, the Citizens Advisory Board meetings. I think it's important to, to, as a council person, to keep in touch with what's going on there in those meetings, to see what's going on, to see how the city council can be supportive of the project and make sure that things run well. If we don't spend the money by 2022, we have to go back to the federal government to seek an extension. Nobody wants to do that. We want to make sure that the plan gets done well, that it gets done right, that it's done in a way that's going to promote and help our businesses and make our neighborhoods be desirable to live in. So as a council person, I think I'll be in an even better position to help make sure that that gets done. All right, so in short, uh, would it be fair to say that all the Hoboken electeds from the uh, council reps up to the uh, state senator, would it be fair that they're kind of just game managers in this project and just making sure that, you know, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed? Well, a lot of the things are definitely lined up. We have AECOM as the engineers that are working really hard, and they're the ones doing the day-in, day-out work, but they're also taking into account the views of the community. And I've been knocking on a lot of doors in the Fifth Ward, John. I've already knocked on 1,500 doors. I've been talking to people. I've been listening to people. And I think that I'm going to have a unique perspective to share as a council person on what the needs of the neighborhood are. And if I can get that to be incorporated into the process, as a council person, I'll have an excellent opportunity to do that. It's a lot of doors. You should take a car. <laughs> <laughs> people in Hoboken <laughs> like to be, have their doors knocked. Not everybody, but most everybody likes to have their door knocked and talked to. Certainly, certainly. So on a different topic, uh, Phil. So I noticed that on Twitter you and a couple of your running mates have been talking about Hoboken's protected bike lanes. Obviously that vote from, uh, what was that, 2017? 2016. 2016. Uh, you know, there's some controversy. Uh, it was a... I, you know, a lot of people that were not in favor of the bike lanes, including our current mayor, Ravi Bala. And uh, this has obviously been an ongoing dialogue with Bike Hoboken and obviously just some regular residents. But just why did you want to bring this conversation back? I mean, is this something that you think a new council could actually revisit? Well, John, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I don't know if you were at our city council meeting last night where there was a vote unanimously done to limit biking on the waterfront and in parks. And I think a lot of the reason why people were speaking out against the way that the bike rollout has been and the concerns about the bike scooter rollout 
is because the city council blew it in 2016. I, I really think that they had an opportunity there to create a protected bike lane on Washington Street, and instead of having scooters on sidewalks where we had that terrible accident, uh, fortunately no one was seriously injured, but a really frightening accident between a woman in a stroller with a three-month-old and an Ojo scooter with an underage rider, uh, the reason why I think these accidents are happening is because we don't have the infrastructure, the protected bike lanes that Mayor Zimmer had wanted and presented to the City Council in 2016. So if people had these bikes on Washington Street behind parked cars, not in the middle of Washington Street, but actually protected, we'd see more people comfortable using their, their scooters in the street. I'd like to see us revisit, is it possible with paint and poles to just have that protected bike lane uh, there, to have protected scooter riders there. I don't see it as an enormous expense. I see it as something that could be done, and it will be done to make better pedestrian safety. It's consistent with the Vision Zero plan, and I do think we should revisit it. Just because we made a mistake doesn't mean we can't admit that we made a mistake and try and do it better. I'd like to do that as a councilman. So if elected, this is something that you would be happy to throw your name behind? Absolutely. All right, and uh, you know, speaking about yesterday's vote, I mean, obviously the the new wrinkle in the mix is the e-scooters. Um, you know, I I didn't uh, read the resolution from start to finish, but in general, you know, this is going to again, as I mentioned earlier, keep uh, the waterfront and the municipal parks free of uh, these new transportation devices. So, obviously, you mentioned the accident. I think pretty much everyone watching is familiar with it. You know, what does this change about that plan and any other future plans with Hoboken moving forward? You know, I think what happened last night is consistent with what the reality is already. People really aren't using scooters in the middle of parks or in the middle of the waterfront. They should be in the bike lanes on the waterfront, and people should be walking through our parks. So I don't really see last night's change as being that big of a difference, but I do think that we should be actively talking about protected bike lanes throughout the city. I think that there should be a circuit where people can go from one part of the city to the other in a protected bike lane in a way that they feel comfortable. Even if scooters were banned from our city, uh, e and I know there are people who would like to see that happen, private scooters are still going to be rolling. People are still going to be biking. People are still going to be using them. We should make it safe for them. We should get them in a place where they can commute, where they can get from one point to another without having to take an Uber, without having to take a Lyft, cut down on the number of cars we have in the city, and make it safer and better for people who want to tr travel cheaply, efficiently, and green. So. Do you think it's possible, hypothetically, of course, for Hoboken to have just about every street with protected bike lanes, or how would how do you, would you go about being a part of the process of establishing the new bike lanes if there were to come? No, I don't think we need to have protected bike lanes in every street. I think most of the streets in Hoboken are going to stay the same, but what I do think is we need to have an interconnected north-south passageway so you could get from one end of Hoboken to another and one to go east-west and a link. So you need to be able to travel safely from one side of the city to the other in a protected bike lane in a route that makes sense. And sure, you could you know, get to that circuit uh, somehow in a way that's safe, but I think that that's the idea. And I think we should listen to our professionals, we should talk to professionals, and figure out which are the routes that make the most sense to do this. I know that there's been discussion in the City Council about this on Clinton Street, there's been discussions about this on 11th Street as possible places, and I think, as I said at the beginning of our interview, that Washington Street makes a whole lot of sense. Gotcha. All right, so anything else on the municipal level? I'll leave it a little open-ended for a moment. Uh, or anything specific in the Fifth Ward that you wanted to touch on as well that we haven't spoke about yet? Well, you know, John, I think a lot of people don't know we have an election coming November 5th. <laughs> uh, you know, I know you cover politics all the time, but people are, do think about national politics, but they don't think about local politics. And the truth is, is that the council races, a council person is, is the most really local way that you can be represented in City Hall. And I have knocked on 1,500 doors because I want to be the person that people feel comfortable coming to. I have a Gmail address, which is HobokenPhil at Gmail. I want people to use it. I return people's messages. I want to be a responsive council person. I want to be someone who people feel comfortable talking to and approaching. I feel like I'm a good listener. 
I think that people miss that in their council people. I think that people feel like if they want to have a good representative in City Hall, it needs to be someone they feel comfortable talking to. Someone if they have a problem, they feel comfortable going to. I want to be that person. I want to be the kind of person that people feel comfortable managing their issues with and dealing with their problems and concerns. So I want to be that person and I want to be that representative and I hope that people will support me on November 5th. Phil, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks, Ladies John. and gentlemen, thanks for watching. We're going to take another commercial break. We're not done. Just hang tight. Newport, the luxury waterfront community on the Hudson River, offers a quality of life you deserve in 10 high-rise rental towers with amenities such as the on-site Newport Path subway, light rail and ferry service, Newport Town Square, three playgrounds, dog run, upscale restaurants, retail giants like Sears, JCPenney, Macy's, and Target. Morton Williams Supermarket is just outside your front door. A health and fitness club, spa, skating rink, and medical facilities are also on site. NewportNJ.com Enjoy the New York skyline from Newport Town Square. Manhattan is just one path stop away or quick ride through the Holland Tunnel. Nursery and private elementary schools all on site. 12 screen movie theater at the Newport Center Mall. Want to visit Newport? Stay at the Western or Marriott Hotel. Go to NewportNJ.com for details. Newport has luxurious towers, great restaurants, shopping, New York skyline views, schools, playgrounds, a marina and yacht club, gym, spa, fine wine, fine living. It's incredible. It's you. NewportNJ.com. Newport. Live like you want. The Jersey City Medical Center. You know it for its award-winning, life-saving ambulance service. It's also your health hub. With health and wellness locations staffed with certified professionals all through Hudson County. The Jersey City Medical Center. Here to help you with your healthy. Here when you need us the most. The Jersey City Medical Center. Visit us on the net to learn more. Jersey City Medical Center, Robert Wood Johnson, Barnabas Health Facility. Let's be healthy together. Good Friend Self Storage in North Bergen, New Jersey is a fully climate controlled facility equipped with state of the art security, packing supplies, a refer friend program, and multiple loading docks convenient for commercial use. Located just off of Route 3 at 4301 Tunnelly Avenue, Route 1 and 9. Call 201 867 2444 or visit us on the web today. Good friend self storage. Let us be your good friend. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are again, Hudson County View, live and uncut. John R. Heidis, and I'm joined with my colleague Mark Businich. Mark, of course, always nice to have you. So first uh yeah. So first things first, I mean obviously we have this we have, uh, well, I don't know what to call it. It's a big story. We yeah. have Bayonne activist and uh, First Ward Council candidate Peter Franco has, uh, we found out through a Freedom of Information Act request that back on August 13th, 2008, he was convicted of having sex with a child who had attained the age of 12 and was under the age of 16 by force and without consent. And uh, this incident apparently occurred back in July 2007, according to these federal documents. So, uh, Mark, obviously this is something that we were working on, uh, you know, obviously it's a colleague, Corey McDonald's story, and sure. unfortunately Corey couldn't be with us this afternoon, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly neither of us are strangers to Peter Franco. Uh, what's your take when you read this story? I, I mean, we didn't really talk about it, so what sure. was your uh, reaction? Well, first of all, great reporting by, uh, by Corey, that is, and um, yeah, and, and we both know uh, Peter, a perennial candidate, uh, very heavily involved in local politics in Bayonne. And um, when I saw the headline the other day, yes, I was very surprised myself. And indeed, John, they are very serious charges. Yeah, so uh, to go into a little bit of the particulars, and by the way, just to uh, correct the record, he's more of a perennial uh, activist or gadfly. This is the first time he's running, so. Good point. Yeah, so just to clarify that, but, uh, you know, according to uh, our information that we obtained from uh, representatives of the federal government. Specifically, uh, Corey spoke with Geronimo Guzman, who is a government informational specialist with the U.S. Army Court of Criminal Appeals. He said that Franco lost two appeals in this matter. And then we also, uh, again, through Corey, had a conversation with William Sharp, who's actually a public affairs officer with the Pentagon's Media and Relations Division, that said Franco served in the Army between April 2006 until his conviction, which was, again, August 13th of 2008, and he was uh, discharged at that time dishonorably. So, you know, obviously this is a lot to take in. This is something that's been in the rumor bill for Bayonne for many years, I'd say about three years. And, uh, you know, it's something that in a way was a little anticlimactic for people because they felt like that this was coming. And in another way, some people felt like they were hit like a sledgehammer and it's a complete surprise. I mean, it's really one or the other, not much in between here. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, 
It's uh, you know it's a tough story. It's a tough story to roll with. I, I understand why some people might be apprehensive, but you know we spent many weeks on this. We did everything we could to vet our information. Some of you will also know that uh, Peter put out a statement on his campaign page today, basically denouncing the story and saying that uh, there was uh, quote unquote inaccuracies, he didn't specify what. So the only other thing I would say on that point is uh, again, you know, we, you know how we obtained our information, we just named uh, the folks from the government we spoke with, you could see the Freedom of Information Act request that is on our webpage on this story, and uh, you could come to your own conclusions, but uh, certainly as of today, we uh, stick by this 110%. So. With all that in mind, Mark, what do you think about the implications, of course, in the council race on November 5th? You know, a four-way dance. You got Neil Carroll, obviously the incumbent, Peter Franco. You have Paul Hagdor and John Cupo. I mean, so what do you think happens now? Uh, well, it's a very excellent point, John. I mean, um, <clears throat> it seems like the repercussions for Peter have uh, already occurred because, uh, for example, according to Corey's uh, reporting, uh, he was a volunteer at a local food pantry uh, with the Catholic uh, Archdiocese and um, yeah it was St. Mary's Church and it was a soup kitchen that they did every I believe it was every Saturday yeah and so um, one of the local residents Mike Morris I think who was quoted in the story brought uh, Peter's uh, past conviction from 2008 uh, to the attention of the Archdiocese and now he's no longer able to volunteer there so we see that kind of repercussion that's happening with the volu with a volunteering effort uh, we, we, he, he may, it may indeed, he may have a difficult time trying to convince voters why he would be uh, suitable to replace uh, Neil Carroll, who currently is the incumbent. Yeah, I mean, obviously the whole food pantry thing, it's a, you know, it's an unfortunate, uh, you know, excuse me for the phrase casualty of war, but uh, it appears that this was something that was, uh, you know, happened in the midst of a obviously heated and contested election, and now it looks like that church, St. Mary's, will no longer have this program, and they're just going to be serving sandwiches, I'm told, uh, until there could be some other solution, which I assume if there is one, it won't happen until after November. So, mm -hmm. like you said, uh, just one of those things that you couldn't really account for, but it looks like things are already going to be interesting. I mean, they already are interesting, but, you know, whatever happens in the... Uh, Upcoming weeks, certainly, we're going to keep you uh, informed. You know, we're still going to cover this race. And John, our... I guess just to interrupt, but I guess has there been any updates? Did uh, Peter respond to Corey? Because I know in the story he asked for uh, comments multiple times. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, there, I should also note that Corey and myself collectively probably reached out to Franco at, at least 10 times. I think that's a conservative figure. Um, again, he did comment. Uh, he did do a Facebook post on his campaign page today, again, saying that he uh, basically disagreed with everything in the story. Uh, again, we put everything out there for everyone to see out in the open, and it's up to them to make their decisions. So we're going to take another break. We'll be right back. Consumer Carpets, 3408 Kennedy Boulevard in the Jersey City Heights, your one-stop store for residential and commercial floor treatments. Carpeting, linoleum, tiles, laminates, hardwood floors, area rugs, remnants, all major brands, all in stock. Free estimates, same-day installation. Consumer Carpets, it's saving, selection, installation. Credit cards and debit cards accepted. Financing available. Consumer Carpets, price to fit your budget, installation to fit your schedule. On the net at ConsumerCarpets.com. Consumer Carpets, Jersey City, 201-792-2712. Panapinto Properties, Jersey City. Shaping the workplace with state-of-the-art office space and an address your company desires. Building residences that define your home environment. Adjacent to all modes of transportation. On-site parking available. The right address, the right lease. 201-521-9000 or visit on the web at panapintoproperties.com Panapinto Properties, building Jersey City for I think it's Kate Cohen or a number of town that maybe he was in Before I tell you why I'm here I would like to tell you why I'm not here Because why I'm not here to call for bans or on motorized scooters I think that scooters have the opportunity to serve as a viable, alternative form of transportation in Hoboken and cities around the world. The scooter hit the right side, the empty side of the stroller. This is where my toddler's legs would have been dangling. His tiny legs would likely have been directly smashed and taken the full impact of that 65-pound vehicle. Every time I look at Elliot these days, I imagine what his life would be like if he had been crippled in that accident. 
So until the beginning of this semester, I was able to leave my apartment and walk to Stevens independently. Um, but this fall, um, things really changed. So like, but I mean, so I'm being blind, I use a cane when I walk. And so the cane clears the area in front of me, um, and I can use that to feel if there are any obstacles in the way. But with the scooters, when they're parked, they're narrow on the bottom, and the handlebars stick up on the top. And so when, my, when I move my cane in front of me to walk, um, the cane will not find the scooters before I do. And so I, I, I have gotten hit twice and fallen down twice on my feet. So I've been working with the director Sharp and looking at the waterfront, we realized in a lot of five organs and say, instead of the entire waterfront, we'll just focus on the areas where there is effectively the same light infrastructure as well as the areas that have our biggest um, larger piece of um, pedestrians, which is from the southern waterfront and northern waterfront. Along the way, we kind of discovered, or I discovered, that in fact, the scooters are not in our parks, which is shocking to me. I walk through church for a park, and every time I see like a four-year-old that is, you know, a foot away from a bike path, and the scooter is going on the bike path, you just think that that is just a disaster that's waiting to happen. I think there's a lot of questions here, and, and, and quite honestly, uh, you know, when we started this, I was absolutely supportive of both programs, and we asked them to convince us that they could do this. And I gave them both the benefit of the doubt. That has changed drastically. They now need to show me, right, from Missouri, to show me safe. Show me you can do it. Right? Because honestly, there's no way I could ever hope to, to continue this title program or, or a permanent program. Hudson County View live at Uncut, John Arhitis, and joined still with Mark Businich. So just real quick on that whole uh, vote that you just, uh, well, that segment I should say you heard about, that was a unanimous vote, 9-0. Once again, to ban e-scooters on Hoboken's waterfront as well as municipal parks. Um, you know, very interesting situation, uh, especially just a little over a week after the city canceled their contract with Ojo, one of two e-scooter companies that they were working with since uh, the spring. That program is up on November 20th. Several council members expressed that they may not be interested in renewing, but they certainly mm -hmm. said that uh, they didn't really think this was the type of thing that they want to do in the winter, so if it were to come back, it would not be until the warmer weather comes back around. So we're going to keep our eye on that. Heading to Jersey City, Mark, uh, mm -hmm. I know that you were following a story that I did regarding a settlement that was released by the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office, and this was about that high-speed police chase I mentioned at the beginning of the show back from June of 2017. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, John, I mean, four officers, involving four officers, uh, as you mentioned, they were involved in a high-speed chase. Uh, the suspect led them uh, through, the, through the city in the confines within Jersey City. Uh, I think it was reported that, that the suspect uh, reached speeds of up to 60 miles per hour, and so obviously the officers who were in pursuit uh, wanted to make sure that the suspect uh, did not cause any bodily harm to any pedestrians nearby, but uh, tragically he uh, then uh, um, crashed into another car, which then both then collided into a telephone pole and one of the cars exploded. But where the, I guess the controversy begins is that the innocent victim of one of the car, one of the driver, who turned out to be an innocent victim, he um, had, had caught uh, fire as a result of the crash. And one of the officers who arrived on the scene, uh, surveillance video showed from a ca uh, from a phone ca uh, surveillance phone camera that is it was both it was a cell phone and a surveillance camera surveillance camera that is yes showed that the officer was kicking the the um, the resident and uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately uh, uh, it that was one of the reasons why the, this officer now is uh, facing a dismissal from the uh, police department. Yeah, so uh, that was Miguel Feliz Rodriguez, the innocent bystander, as many know him. Um, you know, he's actually uh, struck by two officers, according to the prosecutor's office. And, um, you know, those four officers that are being forced to reside are M.D. Khan, Eric Kaczynski, Francisco Rodriguez, Lieutenant Keith Ludwig. So they will all be facing uh, some charges that they pleaded guilty to. We're going to see what happens. We'll keep you updated on the trials. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.